friends, Pastor JC uh, from Brownstown Presbyterian Church, and I'm here at Geyser Park in Seymour, uh, just for a change of scenery, uh, as we continue our journey through the Christian faith as understood from Scripture and presented in the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, as I've always said, catechism simply means teaching, uh, and so this is a concise understanding of what the Reformed tradition, Presbyterianism, what we believe scripture is telling us and it's in a question and answer format 129 questions and believe it or not we've already gone through 56 questions uh, we're gonna have to hustle up if we're gonna end uh, by the end of September if not we'll just bleed into October a little bit no big deal uh, so without further ado friends let's uh, we always start with reading the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism let's do that now the first question and answer the first question what is your only comfort in life and in death answer that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and he has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing ready, and ready from now on to live for Him. Friends, I always start with that first question and answer because it is the foundation of what this catechism, what this teaching is all about. And if you were reading through Scripture, this, is what you, this question and answer are what you would get from what God has done for us in Jesus Christ of coming down to His own creation in order to provide redemption and salvation for all who believe. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing, and it's a wonderful way to start the catechism. So uh, let's go on now. We are now on Lord's Day 22. Remember, there are 52 Lord's Days. Uh, we are on the 22nd Lord's Day. And we will go read through several questions here and answers, and we'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, and we might be a little more brief today. And just to kind of orient us where we've been, uh, we have read the Apostles' Creed early on in the Heidelberg Catechism, and then there have been question and answers that have broken down each part of the Apostles' Creed. And now we are at the final two questions that deal with the Apostles' Creed. And if you'll remember, uh, you know, after the Apostles' Creed says, uh, Jesus descended to the dead, the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, we've talked about all this, he has sitted at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from there he shall come to judge the quick or the living and the dead. And then I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic, Catholic meaning universal, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. And so we are going to be, questions 57 and 58 are the resurrection of the body and life everlasting and what that means to us as Christians. So let's go ahead with those questions now. Question 57. How does the resurrection of the body comfort you? The answer given, not only will my soul be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head, but also my very flesh will be raised by the power of Christ, reunited with my soul and made like Christ's glorious body. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a picture of our future. For every one of us who believes in Jesus Christ, he was raised bodily from the dead. He had a glorified body. You'll remember he had a uh, fish fry on the beach with his friends uh, in uh, John's gospel uh, because he still needed food. And yet he was able to appear in the midst of the disciples when they were worried about the authorities after Jesus was resurrected. Uh, the resurrection of the body uh, says, says two truths. One, there is life after this life. And two, our bodies matter to God. These aren't just worthless vessels. Um, they, are, they will be raised at the end of time, uh, and Christ will raise bodies to have their new and glorious body, just like Christ uh, had that as well. Uh, and that body will live on forever, just like our soul. Uh, and so that is, uh, those are promises. And the resurrection of the body, that's an important concept within Christianity as affirmed uh, in the Apostles' Creed and here in the Heidelberg Catechism. So let's look at question 58. Question 58. How does the article concerning life everlasting comfort you? Answer. 
even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life I will perfect blessedness, such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human heart has ever imagined, a blessedness in which to praise God forever. This question and answer really speaks to something that's in at the heart of the human uh, struggle in this life. Uh, what good is the life everlasting? Many people pray to God, I do too, why do certain things happen in this world? Why do certain things happen to us as individuals? Unfortunately, because we are all um, inheritors of sin, uh, human beings abuse each other. We take advantage of each other. We steal, we hurt other people with our words or with our actions. Um, we struggle in this life and some of us have struggled our entire life, whether from illness or disease or other effects uh, of the fall of humanity and the fall of creation. Uh, everything is tainted with sin and we often live that out. Some have worse lives than others and I don't blame anybody who's been living a, in a terrible situation or had a horrible life why they would I would question God if that were me. And I do question God about some of the terrible things we see in this world. But what does life everlasting have to do with what I'm talking about? Well, think about if you had a life of 80 years and it was the most horrible life you could imagine. I don't wish that on anybody. And I would, I'll love, we love and support all who are struggling. Uh, please come to church, come reach out for help, whether it's to a church or to a social agency or government, reach out for the, any help you might need. Um, but the one help that, or the one assurance that we have is this life everlasting. So if you had a, a terrible life your whole life, you struggled your whole life, but then you have eternity with a loving God, then that's something A, to look forward to, and B, to be totally at peace and at rest and filled with joy for eternity, as, as Paul says, we cannot even compare our present suffering with the glory that is to come. Um, and so we still need to address terrible things that happen in this world. But for the Christian who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there is this blessed assurance of life everlasting. And that life everlasting will be nothing like this life. And you, in fact, you can't even compare it. It's going to be so unimaginably great and filled with joy. Uh, so remember that and hold on to that promise of Scripture. Let's go on and look at uh, question 59. Now we are in Lord's Day 23. This is question 59. What good does it do you, however, to believe all this? Answer given. In Christ, I am righteous before God and heir to life everlasting. So question 59 is uh, kind of humorous. It's saying, remember, I just we went through what the Apostles Creed was and then it broke down each section of the Apostles Creed we're now at the end of that section and the very next question is well what good who cares what does it matter that you believe all these things why does it make a difference look at that question and answer again what good does it do however to believe all this answer in Christ I am righteous before God and heir to life everlasting it's a reminder that through our faith in Jesus Christ, we actually become the righteousness of God. That is an awesome truth of Scripture. Uh, we are not righteous because of anything you or I have done. No matter how good we've been our whole lives, no matter what good we've done in the world um, or for our neighbor, that doesn't gain us one, doesn't get us one inch closer to God. We are close to God and we actually become fully righteous before God because of our faith in Christ. We get Christ's righteousness. Uh, Martin Luther called it an alien righteousness. It's not ours. It comes from someone else. It comes from Jesus Christ and it comes into us. And because we are now righteous before God, we have the promise of everlasting life like I talked about in the previous question. Uh, so think about that and remember that, that your faith in Christ, believe in Christ today if you never have, trust in Him. Answer God working in your heart. And then you will have the assurance of eternal life with God. Ask God to change you. Um, I do that quite often in my prayers for myself. So uh, let's look at the next question. Question 60.
How are you righteous before God? Answer, only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments, of never having kept any of them, and still being inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without any merit of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. And as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me, all I need to do is accept this gift with a believing heart. Well, there it is. It states it outright, everything I just said. Accept Christ with a believing heart. Truly repent and believe. Um, and it, it's through that faith that God works. And by the way, that faith doesn't just appear. It doesn't happen because you hear a wonderful sermon. Um, it happens for, through the hearing of the Word of God. It happens through preaching. Uh, but that is God at work through those things, stirring up within you this faith. And you and I respond to that faith. In fact, we are compelled. We can't not respond if we're feeling that in our heart. So if you're feeling that, friends, put your faith in Jesus Christ and look at what the benefits are. You no longer have to worry about being good or doing good or worrying about God's wrath. Um, that's all in the past because in Christ we are a new creation and we are righteous and holy before God. And therefore we are heirs of salvation uh, just as Christ is an heir. So remember that, that uh, you, if you don't have much uh, of inheritance in this life, or haven't been given much uh, in Christ, through your faith in Christ, you will be given beyond anything you can possibly imagine. Now let's look at the next question. Question 61. Why do you say that through faith alone you are righteous? Answer given. Not because I please God by the worthiness of my faith. It is because only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness make me righteous before God. And because I can accept this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than through faith. So you'll see here, uh, answers, uh, fifth, or question and answers 59, 60, and 61, they're all tying in together and they're all re emphasizing the fact that this is sheer grace of God and it is not anything that we do. And this question and answer pretty clearly states that. Um, look at the answer again. It says, not because I please God by the worthiness of my faith. In other words, our measure of faith is not um, the thing that matters. It's not by the worthiness of my faith. It is because only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, holiness make me righteous before God. So and it's given to us. That's the alien righteousness. And because I can accept this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than through faith. So it all comes down through faith. Uh, the Reformation had what they call the five solas, or sola means alone, and it was scripture alone, uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Um, everything is God-centered, and God brings us salvation through faith in Christ. Let's look at that next question. Uh, we are on Lord's Day 24, and this is question 62. Why can't our good works be our righteousness before God or at least a part of our righteousness? That's a good question. Answer. Because the righteousness which can pass God's judgment must be entirely perfect and must in every way measure up to the divine law. But even our best works in this life are imperfect and stained with sin. Uh, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we are told our righteousness, uh, the things we think we do that are good, uh, it's as filthy rags before God. And why is that? Because, as I said earlier, there is no part of our person that is not affected by sin. Uh, creation is affected by sin. Our bodies are affected by sin. Also, our emotions and our intellect, um, everything is tainted with sin. We are not on our own going to produce righteous works. Uh, it won't happen. Everything has that stain on it. And because of that, it has nothing to do with our works. It's all the sheer grace of God. So let's look at that next question. Question 63. How can our good works be said to merit nothing when God promises to reward them in, the life, in this life and the next? Answer. The reward is not earned. It is a gift of grace. 
So this question is talking about those parts of Scripture that says, if you do this, you will be blessed. Uh, if you do that, this will be the result. Um, it's not because we do that, although it's presented that way in Scripture, a conditional statement, if this, then that. That's part of covenant uh, relationship with God. Um, that is, you can think of it as kind of as a contract, but not so transactional. A relationship is the best way to think of that. Um, and if you fulfill your end of this agreement with God, God will fulfill God's end. Um, and God always does. You and I don't. So what this question is reminding us is that the reward, the if you do this, then this blessing comes. That blessing is not because we did that. It's because of the grace of God. Because in our sinfulness, even if we think we're doing what God has required of us, we're not doing it perfectly. And that's why we need Christ's righteousness, which is the grace of God. And all the benefits that Scripture talk about, if you're doing one thing and here's this benefit, that's sheer grace of God to give you that benefit. Uh, and for us, we understand that through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Uh, let's look at that next question. Question number 64. But doesn't this teaching make people indifferent and wicked? Answer. No. It is impossible for those grafted into Christ through true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. So this is actually a really interesting and good question. Um, doesn't this idea of sheer grace and that our works aren't good enough, doesn't that just make people indifferent and saying, well, I don't care. If, I, if nothing I do is good enough for God, then I'm just going to live a wicked life. Well, that might be the response of some. But for those who are called by God, according to God's purpose, called to faith in Jesus Christ, those who are now in Christ, who have been given the right to be called children of God, it is impossible that they will go on sinning. You should see in your own life, if you trust in Jesus as your Savior, you should see your desire to sin get lower and lower and lower. You should get less and less pleasure from your sin. And you should feel yourself drawn to God more and more, to reading God's Word and the Bible, to coming to worship and being part of a worshiping community, and to desire to know more about this God who has given you so much. Look at that answer, or question and answer again. But doesn't this teaching, that is the teaching of grace and that our works merit nothing, make people indifferent and wicked? Answer, no. It is impossible for those grafted into Christ through true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. We're going to get to this later in the Heidelberg Catechism. Our entire lives become a response to what God has done, a grateful response. And so, friends, I want to leave you on that note of gratitude. I want to thank you for joining us today. And I want you to know you are always welcome at Brownstown Presbyterian Church. Our services are every Sunday at 1030 a.m., uh, right across from the high school in Brownstown. And uh, we have a saying there that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are welcome at Brownstown Presbyterian Church. Uh, we pray God has blessed you this week, and let's close in prayer uh, before we go. Uh, loving and holy God, we give you thanks for the free gift of grace in Jesus Christ. Uh, we pray for people to respond to you and your calling of faith that you have given them and placed in their heart. Uh, help us all, Lord, who believe in you to produce good fruit, to sin less and less, and to desire to be a part of your family, the church, your hands and feet here on this earth, and then help us to do works of love out of our gratitude for what you have done for us. Bless all those who have uh, watched today and continue to work in all the ways that you do, Lord, in their lives. Uh, we thank you when we give you praise, honor, and glory now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you, and we will see you next week for another Throwback Theology Thursday.